Um, I'm going to give my annual talk now on the opera on stage. I probably won't actually be talking about staging next year because I'll be talking about love. But um, uh, what I'd like to do now is to, to talk about how it has been interpreted over the years. Um, first, I, I think I should just sort of um, uh, begin with one or two caveats, which I often do. Uh, and first is, is that um, people sometimes feel that the way in which an opera was first performed uh, should be regarded as a fixed text. In other words, the staging really should be as unchanged as the, um, uh, as, as the music and the, uh, the, the libretto are. Um, but in fact, uh, this has never, ever happened. It has never, ever been possible to keep a production on stage year after year after year, repeating the same old formulae and having it full of life and vitality in the way that, that, which, that draws the attention of the audience. And actually, uh, the um, figures who are most aware of this are the composers themselves. For example, Wagner did write stage directions for The Ring, as he did for others of his operas. However, we have copious documentation of Wagner in rehearsal. And Wagner constantly saw the possibility of, um, of, of difference. He constantly encouraged actors to improvise. He was uh, constantly worried about the design. He felt the design didn't work well here, didn't work well there. And indeed, we do know that he was very dissatisfied with the ring after it had been performed, with the staging of it. And he said, if I'm going to do this again, I will come forward and do it in a totally different way. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that in a moment. Uh, but to give another parallel, uh, and this is Giuseppe Verdi, who was actually very much concerned with the production of his operas. And as a lot of research in archives has demonstrated over the last several decades, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the variety of ways in which Verdi's operas were performed is quite considerable. And Verdi himself was involved in many of these different productions. For example, we have the production book of Umbello in Mascara when it was first performed in Rome um, in, the, in the 1850s. Uh, and then Verdi became involved in another production uh, elsewhere in Italy and then in Paris, which had totally different sets, a totally different blocking, and he was entirely at ease with this different interpretation. Uh, and I'm going to get, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to um, this in a little bit more detail um, when I get down to the, the, um, the, the, the material itself. Uh, but uh, one thing is, the great operas, and particularly Wagner's great operas, are in fact so complex, as we have realized, that there are many, many different themes that come out of them. And often, um, it, it, it is not possible to encompass all those themes in one production. It would, just, it is, would just be beyond the power of the performers and beyond the comprehension of the audience as well. And so, very frequently, um, as I will be showing, directors and designers pick out certain themes which they emphasize, most obvious one, of course, being the Shero Ring, which emphasized certain aspects of the action in contrast to other aspects. So there are many approaches, and staging is one of the ways in which we can explore these different approaches. Um, so the next, the one thing I think we ought to realize is that the stage directions uh, that um, come in uh, written texts are, in fact, indications of what meaning is intended rather than orders about the way in which a work should be put on. Indeed, um, I, I'm, this does not necessarily apply to, um, uh, to, to Wagner's work, but it does apply to a tremendous amount of operas and a tremendous number of plays. Very frequently, stage directions are written in well after the text has been written. They have been put in by publishers. They've been put in by, by, um, uh, by, 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 by different hands um, just to sort of aid in the way the play might be seen. Uh, when I direct plays, I absolutely refuse to use the Samuel French texts. Because if any of you have looked at the Samuel French text, it is absolutely chock full of stage directions. And indeed, when people direct a play or an opera, they actually really don't need too many of those directions. Maybe you just need them to get some idea of what the author had in mind, but in fact, you don't want those stage directions crippling your imagination. Um, the, um, and, and I think one other thing I would say, of this, there's a considerable controversy, of, there always has been, about different um, directorial approaches. But I think the one thing I sh should say is that if in some bizarre case, bizarre world, 
it was possible to insist that people only ever do one particular production and stage it in one particular way. That work would disappear from the stage in a few um, uh, years' time. Indeed, I think variety of staging is one of the ways in which opera remains interesting to us today. Um, and furthermore, uh, another important aspect of it is, is these works um, uh, were, were written at a time very different from our own. And they are only going to be of interest to us if we, in fact, find that they are relevant to our own time. Now, admittedly, once we discovered how they're relevant to our own time, they get even more interesting when we go back and we see how they were also relevant to the time in which they were, they, they were written. But the relevance to our own time is particularly important. Uh, and this is where the, the freedom of the stage director to give us um, uh, modern interpretations is, is very important. Uh, let me just say one other thing before I start um, uh, showing the pictures on Goethe Demerung, uh, because this does relate to, to um, uh, what we will be seeing. Uh, I'm often asked, I, I do a, write a lot of criticism, particularly for uh, opera news and for, um, uh, for one or two German uh, periodicals and for Musical America. And um, uh, people often ask me, in fact I had this uh, question last year at a conference in London, um, what criteria do you use to judge the quality of a production? And I actually come up, I have five criteria. Actually, if I can think about, I can actually probably think of a few more, but there are five that really come up uh, that are important. First, I find I react, and this is very personal, I react to any work, any production that trivializes the material. For me, that is the prime crime. If it trivializes the material, tosses it off, pretends it's not really of importance. That, I find, is, um, is, is, is offensive. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the, the work is, is, is utterly dismissive and I don't really feel it's, it's worthwhile seeing. Uh, secondly, I, I find myself uh, very... Um, when I go to a production, I want to make sure I understand it and I don't want to have to be laboring over the ideas that the director had and worrying about that rather than worrying about the music. I had a bit of a problem with that one last night when we had those Guernica type uh, figures projected onto the, onto the, the walls. I said, well, what's that there for? And I actually found myself losing attention uh, from, the, uh, from the music itself. So I think that there is sort of, um, uh, that the, the director's concept and the, and the work being staged need to be spontaneous. You should not feel that the director is imposing a set of ideas upon the opera that the opera itself resists. Um, uh, thirdly, and this is terribly difficult to explain, well, terribly difficult, yes, terribly difficult to explain in some ways. Uh, let me just touch upon it. I find that I most appreciate a production when the director respects my independence as, a, as a, a spectator. In other words, when I see what is going on, I can see what the director's ideas are, but at the same time, there's an indication that these ideas are not the only way in which you can approach this work. This is actually a very difficult thing to explain technically, but that is one major criterion. Um, Another thing that I think is specific to the theatre, be it spoken theatre or be it musical theatre, uh, and this is that the director should stay within the bounds of the score. Films adapt. Films are, and, and, is a, is a, and films are a wonderful medium to adapt plays, to adapt novels, to change the story. And indeed, films do not have playwrights and librettists writing for them. They have scriptwriters. And a scriptwriter is something very different. A scriptwriter sort of uh, it, it work, it turns out a work that is constantly being changed. One of the attractions I find about theatre, particularly classic theatre, is the work is there. You've got to meet the parameters of that work and the challenge that, that work offers. Uh, and then uh, one other c uh, consideration is um, how original is what I see, how original and how fresh, and also, very important, how witty. We don't have enough witty productions of The Ring. There could you, you can do some tremendously witty stuff with The Ring. For example, Wotan and Brunhilde at the beginning of Act Two of Die Valkyrie can be a wonderful comic play. The Valkyries can be very funny. Hagen 
you can sort of act Hagen with a real sort of um, ironic wit that can make him uh, actually funny, but also that much darker. So originality and wit, I think, are also very important elements. Um, and certainly, I, I, uh, just recently, actually, the, the, um, the, the, the comedy quotient, co quotient in Ring productions is, is, is coming up. There are some productions where you really can't laugh. There's not much of a laugh in Tristan and Isolde, uh, nor in Parsifal. But there's a lot of laughs, whatever people might say in Die Meistersinger. Uh, and indeed, um, I have seen uh, one or two quite witty productions, well, very witty productions of Tannhäuser. Uh, the act two, in fact, can be, um, be, can be um, a, a wonderfully... Um, um, enlivening comedy. Um, so um, the originality and wit, I think, are also important. Now, down to the actual material of Goethe Demering on stage. And now, just back to Wagner, uh, because Wagner himself um, uh, staged the ring, and it was a process that was very well recorded. Uh, and, and from this, we can deduce three things. First, Wagner was very unsatisfied with the realistic sets in which his production was staged. And he felt far more attention should have been paid to the symbolic meaning of the action. And we have evidence from this from Cosima's diaries and from letters. There were, in, in, in other words, the, the stage production of uh, uh, The Ring in 1876 was not necessarily a completely happy process. Uh, in actuality, Wagner was about 10 or so years ahead of his time in saying that he wanted to see more attention paid to the symbolic action. In other words, representing on the stage and in the scenery what the work means rather than what, how the work might appear in everyday life. Uh, and it was, Wagner was probably about 10 years ahead, um, though in fact there were many critics, both of Wagner's operas and indeed critics a contemporary with Wagner writing about other theatrical works, who were beginning to express this idea, let us get away from literal reality, let us begin to see productions and sets that tell us the sort of the deeper the broader, the more universal meanings of the action. And Wagner became, was very concerned about this. Um, the, uh, essentially, in fact, uh, for Wagner and for many critics, uh, the trees got in the way of the wood. Uh, the details of the action were too prominent in contrast to the broader span of the action. So he very much um, resisted the idea of, um, uh, or, or, or would like to have resisted the idea of realism. He couldn't resist it because it was the conventional way in which operas were put on. Uh, another thing, though, was he had a very fluid conception of staging. Uh, he didn't insist on everything being fixed in rehearsal and that what happens in rehearsal has to happen in exactly the same way on stage. He encouraged actors to improvise. He encouraged a certain degree of of, of, of unexpectedness in the staging. Uh, however, he did meet opposition primarily from the performers themselves, who actually would have been much happier to be, to be told, you stand here and just do what you're doing and, 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 and don't worry. Um, the, uh, so, but uh, he encouraged I I improvisation without too much success. Uh, but an another important issue was theatricality was his prime concern. He wanted, uh, he, as he said time and time again, and by the way, Giuseppe Verdi said the same, what we want is a very effective first-class work of theatre. And this meant, of course, perfection in singing and perfection in playing. Theatre does not mean to say that you abandon one particular discipline in order to pursue another. No, what you do is you have perfect singing and perfect playing, but also you have a high quality of acting. Uh, and the staging and the design should also very clearly represent and the, 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 clearly the, the, the pattern of the action. The one problem with Wagner was that uh, I'm sorry to say that Wagner was not perfect in all realms of uh, activity and thought, but he had a very poor visual imagination. He knew what was wrong, but he didn't know how to put it right. Um, so he realized that these sets are too cluttered, but what do I put in their place? That he didn't know. It was only just before he died, when he did Parsifal, when he said, when he, he realized that the sets of Parsifal were too cluttered, and, in, and also, people were too literal in their movements. And I've quoted this here before. It's one of my favorite moments, uh, uh, quotations in Wagner. Uh, after doing Parsifal, he said, we have suddenly realized that a half gesture 
is more expressive than a full gesture. And that was the first movement towards what we call minimalism, or in fact, almost parallel in this case, symbolism. In other words, moving towards a, 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 a production in which the sort of the general meaning um, is uh, the, the arc of the meaning is given rather than detail after detail. But let's just have a, a, a picture of a few sets that have come down to us today from Bayreuth. Uh, here we have a few pictures from the original production or based on the original production. Uh, I'm afraid uh, the, the my my laptop and this uh, um, projector don't speak to each other quite as well as they should do. So you're going to find these pictures are a little bit foreshortened. Um, but um, here we have Act One, the Gibichung Hall uh, uh, from, um, from Bayreuth. Um, notice um, we have still a, a very symmetrical action. The set is arranged uh, in, 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 a very, in, in perspective, which really relates to the way in which sets have been designed in the European theater for the 300 years beforehand perspective sets were what most people saw. But by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, people were getting mighty bored with them. Um, the, uh, the, notice, though, that there's considerable detail on uh, attention to the details of the carving. Um, as for the costumes, uh, the costumes were claimed to be historically accurate, but I think we'd better put that accurate in inverted commas. Um, in, in, in fact, um, they probably were not that accurate. And anyway, who really knew Knew what the costumes were of the sort of the the quasi mythical um, quasi historical period in which Goethe Dämmerung is set. There can be no historical accuracy for Die Walküre or for Siegfried. Um, uh, here we have got um, Siegfried's return. Uh, this is the beginning of Act Two. Very very character. This, this is. Of course, it's an oil painting that is, that is taken from the stage, and we can be pretty confident the stage wasn't quite as full and as romantic in appearance as it is here. But certainly, uh, the, the, this, is, this gives us an idea of the scenery. It, it's, it's beautiful. It's very full. It's, it's very pictorial. Um, uh, and and um, the, uh, we have these, these, these great big... Um, uh, um, um, these great big gorges. And, you know, people who are concerned, say that they were concerned with historical accuracy, should actually realize they should be geographical accuracy as well. If anybody's been to the Rhine Valley, you'll know the Rhine Valley doesn't look anything like that. Um, in fact, that is, is, is a little bit more sort of um, um, Gothic and, uh, and Alpine in the tenants. Uh, but the, um, uh, we have this very romantic forest. But notice one thing, and this is from all the pictorial uh, 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 um, material we have from the first production of Goethe Derman, Wagner stage directions that there should be altars um, erected to Wotan and to Fricka and to the other gods, which I made so much of uh, yesterday. Actually, um, it was probable that they were not in the original sets. Um, uh, so um, uh, the, the tombs of the gods uh, and the altars of the gods uh, did not seem to appear. Uh, here we have Siegfried and the Rhine daughters. I'm glad I didn't see this production because there we have the daughters. If, if this is what the production looked like, the daughters of the ring are just in this tiny little sort of space in the middle of the stage which probably they made small because they wanted to give the impression that they were in the water and they were very, they didn't have means of representing water in the rather convincing way that we can today. We actually will have real water on the stage or of course we'll have water as we saw in the, the Shero Ring, it was sort of um, uh, very clearly uh, artificial water but works very, very well for the stage itself. Uh, but here, um, uh, because these, um, the, the, the Rhine daughters have to be in the, in, in, in the, uh, in a pool, uh, they occupy only a tiny part of the stage. Uh, I should think that the relationships between Siegfried and the, uh, and the, the Rhine daughters were very, very difficult to set up. Um, so actually, uh, one thing we can say is it, it, this picture gives us uh, a clear idea that we're still at a point where theatrical considerations did not outweigh realistic situations. It was still realism they wanted to establish on the stage. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and then uh, here we have um, one further. This is a picture of Siegfried's funeral march. Again, this is not actually of a stage production, but we can see how that, in fact, funeral march could easily be fitted into the set um, of, um, of, the, of the Rhine Maidens, which I've just seen before, uh, and indeed could actually be fitted into the set that was used for Act Two. So probably actually what they did use, they used the same structures, but changed some of the details of the scenery. Um, um, 
So uh, the production of the Bayreuth Ring in 1876 um, had been declared by Cosima as being sort of primarily holy writ, uh, and, and she tried to preserve it as Wagner uh, directed it, uh, to, and just literally tried to sort of keep this relic of a production going on and on for year after year after year. She did the same fell, and then of course when the other operas came to be performed in Bayreuth, um, uh, uh, all the, the, you know, the ten canonical operas, um, she uh, essentially used the productions that Wagner had done in Munich, and she used the production books. So that it was, so uh, Bayreuth really sort of essentially became a museum for what Wagner had done in, uh, or for the, for the, for the final version of Wagner's productions. Wagner himself would have been appalled at what Cosima did. From everything we know, he felt that in fact change, newness, was very important. And the fact that his works were just being done in the same way year after year after year, he would in fact have had real problems with that. Um, and in fact, anyway, it's impossible. Because whatever happens, productions do change. Um, inevitably, they lose their edge or maybe they gain a different edge from the one the, uh, they originally had. They lose their currency. People don't find them quite as interesting when they're seeing sets from 10 or 15 years old. It was Peter Brook who very famously said, um, each theatre production has a life of five years. He said, after that, a production should come off. Because it gets old-fashioned, it gets stale. We need to make it alive and new again. Um, another thing, of course, is also styles and visual change. Uh, visual styles change, and tastes change as well. Um, and in fact, by the time Cosimo was approaching her death in the 1920s, uh, from the visual evidence we have, there were actually several changes occurring in the production of Wagner's operas, despite the fact that she claimed to be keeping them as they were. And indeed, there were changes in the works that she herself actually was responsible for staging. What did happen was what was happening everywhere in the operatic world, and indeed in the theatrical world. Realism was gradually being pared down, sets were becoming simpler, Action was becoming more direct. There was more of an attempt to try to sort of take away fussy detail. And we see that actually occurring also in Bayreuth in the 1910s and the 1920s. Uh, Cosima died in, 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 in 1930, and just as she did die, she'd been having a terrible row with, um, uh, with um, Siegfried uh, Wagner over a production he was going to put on a Tannhäuser, which was going to be put on in a modern style. But almost immediately after she died, there was a production of The Ring in uh, Bayreuth, uh, di uh, directed and designed by Emil Pretorius and Heitz Tietjen. And here we have the sets from, uh, from that ring. Uh, and those of you, I, I, I'm not talking about Adolf Appiah because I have actually talked about Appiah a lot here over, uh, over the years. Uh, but these uh, sets quite clearly show the influence of Appiah's ideas. Um, there is, we can still see the remnants of, uh, of, of uh, realism. Uh, we have uh, this sort of the, um, a, a pine tree here. Uh, we have a relatively realistic depiction of mountains here. And then we have this sort of this, this, this um, uh, magnificent uh, rock here, which is Brunhilde's rock. Um, so the really important thing about this set, and indeed about this, uh, of, of this set as well, um, here we have got the, um, this is, um, I can't quite read it. Um, it is Valkyrie, yes, it's Valkyrie Act 3. Uh, uh, and, and here we have another, another version. We have different versions of the same set, but we can see the same principle at work here. Just sort of big, big mass, much more interest in space alone. And the crucial thing about these sets was they tended to take away all the, 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 the detail so that the audience would not be absorbed by detail. They themselves could start imagining the action. And it's much easier to imagine the action in a set such as this than in one where the... Um, uh, the, the, um, the, the scenery is, 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 is full of detail. Uh, so actually, there was a radical departure from realism in Bayreuth in the early 1930s, and this applied um, to the, uh, the, the production of The Ring. We, I don't have a picture of Goethe Demeron uh, from this period. Uh, however, all of this came to uh, a halt when uh, this gentleman here, uh, 
uh, decided that Bayreuth was his own particular personal domain, and he said we must return to the old romantic realistic uh, um, uh, productions because he had uh, a very um, monumental, a deathly monumental view of what the world is. And he felt that Wagner's works should just be done, uh, as it were, frozen in time. Um, but I very much doubt uh, that this is something that Wagner himself would have wanted. Um, of, of course, what happened was, uh, was it after, after the war, uh, Bayreuth had no money. And so they needed to start putting on the productions in as sort of uh, sparse a way as they could. And this is where Wieland Wagner, uh, one of the great geniuses actually of, uh, the, the, of the, in the history of directing, Wieland Wagner made a virtue of necessity and said, if we don't have the money to create these big detailed sets, then we will, we will create abstract sets. Then we will take the principle that we see in, uh, in, in these sets. And actually, he did take both, uh, both the ideas of Praetorius and Teach and, and also of Adolf Appia before them. He said, these are the uh, principles upon which we will put the productions together. And in fact, everything will be, uh, will be um, uh, abstract. And we will require the audience to imagine for themselves what is happening on the stage, the broader world in which this happens, which, by the way, makes for a much more absorbing activity for the audience as well. It's, I, I find we're much more interested in the theatre when we have to imagine ourselves what is happening than just have it all served up to us on a plate. Uh, so here we actually have Act Two of uh, Goethe Dämmerung, as it was uh, directed by Wieland Wagner in 1954. Uh, this is actually about three years after the Bayreuth Festival first opened with Parsifal, uh, and um, uh, you, you can see here um, the, uh, the we have the idea almost of sort of, of, of an uh, arena here, uh, but we have the master um, vassals around here uh, and, and a very very spare set indeed. Um, this is uh, Brunhilde and Siegfried. I don't know whether this is Act 3 of Siegfried or Act or the prologue to Goethe Demerum. Um, I just, uh, when I, I got the slide off the internet, there were no identifying markers for it. It could be either of those two, but actually this, more than perhaps any other slide, gives you some idea of the minimalism that Wieland Wagner introduced. He introduced it first for reasons of economy. Another one was they wanted to, in fact, dismantle the political implications of Wagner's works for obvious reasons. And, and, and doing it in this abstract way did it. The great thing about Wieland Wagner was he had a fabulous sense of beauty. Every, I, I never saw a Wieland Wagner production, and it's one of I, it's something that I, I, I deeply regret, uh, because his productions look so astonishingly beautiful. Um, uh, the, 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 the one um, uh, director who's close to him today is, is Robert Wilson. If any of you have seen any of Robert Wilson's really good productions, you just sit there and you look at that blue that he puts on the stage, and you look at it forever, and you get completely absorbed into it. This is very much sort of the world of the, the, which we can... Um, we we can inhabit with our own imagination. Um, now, um, what I want to focus on now, I'm not going to go through the complete history of Wagnerian production. What I'd like to do now is to focus more upon our own time. Uh, since the 1970s, uh, Wagnerian production uh, in general has been um, extraordinarily eclectic. Uh, and um, that eclecticism is still apparent today. And I think it's one of the excitements of Wagner that his work is subject to such a sort of a wide range of, um, uh, of interpretation. Um, and certainly, um, it has caused, called forth, uh, the, the, the works have called forth a more almost bewildering variety of styles. In fact, over the bicentenary year, last year, um, where rings seemed to come out, sort of, you know, you'd just go around the corner and you'd find a ring cycle walking toward you. Uh, but there were ring cycles everywhere, and there are an, an extraordinary range of different interpretations. Some of them, uh, rather, those interpretations I don't particularly like, which seem to sort of trivialize or, or, or or, or another way, um, they, they um, uh, imposed ideas that are very, very difficult to understand. And so you're, you're worrying more at the ideas than you are at the, the, the work itself. But in fact, there have been many quite exciting interpretations. 
questions. Uh, but, um, uh, but, but, you know, even Wagner ultimately is not inexhaustible, and so there are those directors who do find themselves um, uh, um, uh, uh, straining. Now, I'm now going to so show a series of slides, most of them from the last 10 years, um, uh, uh, to show how Goethe Demeron is interpreted today. And there's one other thing I would like to sort of um, 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 emphasize here. Um, if you read the history books, the theater history books, the operatic history books, they'll say, naturalism, 1880 to 1895, symbolism, 1895 to 1910, expressionism, 1910 to 1925 or something, and so it goes on like that, as if the arts go in sort of, um, uh, sort of um, uh, we, we move from one form of art to the other, and we forget the art that we had previously. Now, this is not the way in which the, the artistic world, certainly the work of the performing arts uh, um, uh, operates. Uh, the great period of naturalism in Europe European drama was, I suppose, from about, actually about 1875 through to about um, 1895 to 1900. However, when naturalist drama came not quite, uh, approaches became not quite as popular as they used to be, naturalism did not disappear. It merely, in fact, became one stratum in our theatrical culture. And we can still see today marvelously naturalistic productions of Wagner and indeed of many other classic playwrights. The same is true of symbolism. Its big dates are 1895 through to about 1910, through about the First World War. However, symbolism, while it is no longer the dominant artistic mode, still, in fact, is very, very much present in our theater. And the same applies to, uh, to, to, to many other of the isms, expressionism, epic theater, dada, absurdism. Indeed, most of those forms have found their way into Wagner every now and then. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to do now is to give some idea of the, the, the sort of the, the wealth of um, interpretations that we have um, in our own time. And, and let us begin. Uh, with symbolism and minimalism, um, I, I, the, the, um, it, it seems to me that um, uh, this is um, uh, certainly one of the uh, most important modes in which Wagner has been created because it was actually through symbolist interpretations early in the 20th century that, that um, uh, directors and then scholars and critics and performers began to feel out the broader meanings of Wagner's works. And symbolism is still alive and well. For example, there is the production of The Ring at Aix en Provence in 2000, direct, uh, 2009, I beg your pardon, uh, directed by Stefan Braunschweig, uh, which, wa which was extremely minimalist here we have the three Rhine daughters at the beginning of, um, act, um, uh, of um, um, act Three. Uh, I should stress, by the way, that I have not seen most of these productions. I have neither the time nor the means to do nothing but travel around the world seeing Ring productions, and so one does have to depend a lot upon the material that one finds. But um, the reviews of Aeon Provence were not actually completely encouraging. Um, uh, for some, I came across one review that said this production was a decorous whimper and claimed that it didn't have full blood, there wasn't a full blooded production. However, I must confess the, the, the sets themselves have a sort of a rather, a rather beautiful elegance to them. Here we have the Rhine Daughters. Uh, here we have got, this is quite interesting actually, this is Brunhilde and Val Trauter. Uh, so there was sort of in this minimalist sort of uh, set um, a, a, a a touch of the domestic, though um, uh, this was a very characteristic way in which a symbolist sets with the symbolist designers would represent rooms uh, that we'd have walls that just sort of you know disappear up into the heavens. Uh, and here we have um, uh, uh, Siegfried just before he is uh, he is murdered. I actually rather like that one. It is sort of you know very elegant, very sparse. However, I think probably. Five hours of that minimal set might be just a little bit straining on one's, um, uh, on one's uh, patience. Um, and at times, uh, minimalism uh, can look to be, uh, to be cheap and nothing else. Uh, here, for example, we have a production that was done in Bari in 2011. This is the entry of the... No, 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 no. This is Act 2, the, um, the, the, um, the entry of... Uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, Gunther and um, Brunhilde uh, and, the sum uh, and the summoning of the vassals. Not very many vassals there. Uh, and in fact, um, 
I think probably one would be a little bit um, uh, strained in credibility uh, seeing that. However, this was in fact sort of in the archive that I looked in, this is a picture from Act 3, Scene 1 of Goethe Dämmerung. And I would assume that those sort of those pillars there, of which there must be about five or six of them, in some way or other represent the Rhine daughters. Uh, here we would have, I assume, Siegfried, and here we have the Rhine daughters, and this sort of this this sort of rather abstract way of uh, representing uh, sort of figures who, in many ways, stand for abstract ideas, um, is sort of perhaps rather beautifully realised here. Um, this is the production that I've mentioned to you before, uh, the, the production of Goethe Demmering in Nuremberg in 2003, directed by Stephen Lawless. Uh, I don't know, do you have Stephen Lawless directing in Washington, D.C.? You'd, yeah, he, he's, I, I, he's, he's actually a, 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 a wonderfully versatile director. Um, he, he, he directs a, a lot in Santa Fe and in Los Angeles, has, has done some really interesting work. Uh, and this is the, uh, the Norn scene, um, where we have the rope. And in the course of the scene, the rope becomes tangled up. And then it comes back in later scenes. Here, for example, we have Act Two of, um, the, of, uh, uh, of um, Goethe Demmerung, uh, in which um, uh, Brunhilde seems to be being pulled by Gunther with the actual ropes that the Norns had broken. And looking at other pictures from the production, it seems that this is, in fact, a, a, a standard, uh, that, that, that um, those ropes were always present. And that, in many ways, is a, a wonderful example of symbolism, to the extent that you really get that sense of everybody getting tied up in, in tangle uh, and, and, and that there is no longer any purpose in, uh, uh, or, or direction in life. Um, the, um, I, I came across a, a few pictures of um, the, uh, the production of The Ring uh, from Dresden in 2003, directed by Willy Decker. Somebody was telling me they saw a ring fairly recently in Dresden. I don't know whether it's the same one. Yeah, is it the same one? They, they've changed it, have they? Yeah, yeah, pictures are not, yeah, pictures are not yet available of it. Uh, but this is of the, 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 the Vili Decker, which is actually, um, uh, I, I, Vili Decker is, a, a, is um, he's one of those directors who I, I, I find I, I prize very much. He is very much capable, you probably know his uh, very famous Traviata, the one he did with Natrebko and Villazon in, uh, in Salzburg, uh, where the whole of Traviata is set in almost a surreal um, Greek orchestra pit. Uh, but actually, it's one of those wonderful examples where the concept and the work come together perfectly. And, and, and Decker himself actually has done a number of very effective Wagner productions as well. Uh, I saw a, a, a very, very fine Tristan and Isolde that he, he directed in Ghent a few years ago. Um, uh, but um, uh, here we have got um, the beginning of Goethe Demmerung, the prologue, Brunhilde and, uh, and, and Siegfried. And from what I can make out, the world is there and there are seats set out to observe the world. And in some ways we could see this as almost a rather wicked Brechtian idea of sort of setting up what we are going to now see is a performance of our own time and how it relates to the world as a whole. Um, I, I have not seen the Frankfurt Ring, but I know, Michael, you have seen it. Has anybody else seen it? Um, but um, uh, this seems to be a, a really fascinating work. I noticed that we also do have the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the red rope um, uh, among the Norns. Uh, this actually is the opening scene with the Norns. There are other sort of characters and what looks like mannequins on the stage. Uh, does that rope, Michael, stay on stage all the time? No. It doesn't. It does. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing about, about this production is um, it has one set for the whole ring, which is this, this series of uh, concentric circles. But from what I can make, and I actually um, last uh, weekend actually uh, saw a book that is a, is a the very, very detailed picture by picture uh, version of the whole production. It's astonishing the degree of variety they could get in these uh, concentric circles. So one uh, gets the impression, a lot of people have claimed that for 14 to 15 hours, your eye is constantly absorbed by what is going on on stage. Um, but um, this was, on the whole, has been a very successful ring, uh, which uses um, uh, concentric circles um, as a visual reflection of um, how the aspects of the music and the action relate to each other. And you often get the sense of action within action. 
Uh, here we have um, the, um, uh, the summoning of the vassals. This looks fantastic. You know, sort of, it's, it's like they're on a, some sort of ship that's sort of, you know, about to sink. Um, but um, uh, it's it, it, very, very ingeniously put together. Uh, and here we have um, uh, Siegfried and the Rhine daughters. Uh, the Rhine, three Rhine daughters are looking pretty much like valley girls, actually, uh, which they often do. Uh, and you get a good example here of how those rings could have been used in different ways. And I'm not quite so sure what that rubber dinghy is doing there. But um, I can see it could be put to good use in that scene. It, it was what? It was his boat. And he, had, he was uh, located on one of the circles and they rotate as well. So it kind of came into view at one point. All right. It, this, if I might just interject for a second. Please. This was a fabulous use of a machine that really worked as in contrast to the men's balance. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, I have heard that from other people who have seen it. This does seem to be one of the really, sort of, the real successful rings of the last uh, uh, few years. Um, uh, there are some strongly symbolist elements uh, also in some American productions. Um, uh, not necessarily minimalist symbolism, uh, but um, uh, there are moments um, in, in a lot of productions we've seen in America just recently um, in which, uh, which work suggestively rather than through realism. Uh, for example, um, I know this is a uh, particularly zone of contention, but we do have Lepage's production of uh, uh, The Ring at the Met in, in 2012. I went through many, many pictures of it, and I picked this one out because I liked it. Uh, this is of, um, uh, of uh, Siegfried's journey to the Rhine, and here we have, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read it here we have the three um, uh, Gibichungs. Uh, and here we have uh, Siegfried himself. And actually, I rather like that because it does suggest that sort of more romantic quality to, 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 to Siegfried that is particularly important. And then, of course, there was my favorite production, The Ring, not everybody's. And this was uh, the, the, the famous Achim Freyer production in, in, uh, um, in, in Los Angeles in 2010, uh, which um, uh, among its many sort of strengths and, and many, some of its more bizarre qualities, but one of the things that, that, that Freyer did, which um, I wish other directors would pick up on, is he introduced visual light motifs so that you got the sense that what you were seeing on the stage had in some way reflected what was the way in which the music was assembled in the orchestra. Um, this was actually uh, a, 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 a very, uh, ultimately turned out to be a sort of a, a very successful uh, work indeed, um, to judge anyway by the response of the audience and the, um, the, uh, the cycle that I saw. Um, uh, the next sort of set of uh, productions are uh, sort of, uh, I've categorized less by style and more by content. The ring, industry, and the military, because actually ever since the early 1970s, the industrial implications of the action have been quite frequently taken up by directors. Shero's ring was, of course, the most famous of them, but Shero's ring actually, in many ways, comes at the, at, at sort of, at, at the, sort of the, the first culmination um, of this movement. Uh, but we do have to realize that Wagner did see the ring as being a peak of uh, an industrial, commercial, and militaristic society. And so he does see this as, he did see this, uh, the, the, the themes that come out in these works as being particularly important. Uh, and of course, this was the approach of the Shero Ring, which actually um, uh, is, is, it was indeed one of the most important uh, productions of the ring in, um, uh, in, in, in history. Uh, the, uh, I put up there, 1976, as, as Jeffrey pointed out to us last night, the sets did change very much over the, the, the five to six years that it was performed, and what we saw was, uh, was, was 1981, and I have a feeling that maybe actually what we saw was pretty close to what we see here, so probably that 1976 date is a little bit misleading. Uh, but this was um, the centenary ring. Um, it had a strongly realistic dimension. It really didn't go outside realism. It did not, as I said, last night take on overt Brechtian features. Um, 
um, and, and it's certainly to emphasize industry. Uh, but last year, I actually had to do a, uh, I did a paper on the Shero Ring for, for a, the, a conference in London, and um, I, I, I watched the ring, uh, the Shero Ring, right the way through uh, again. And it was really very interesting to see it because when it came out, it had the reputation of being left-wing and radical. And when we look at it today, actually, political ideology is nothing. It doesn't really come to the fore. What it does do is I find it brings out the tragic focus of the work um, uh, much more clearly than other productions have. This production has little time for nobility. It looks at people from a very sort of realistic um, uh, uh, point of view. Um, and toward the end, uh, of course, um, as we heard yesterday, uh, there is more of a focus on the people. Um, it, um, it was also a work that brought out much specificity in a Wagner production. Uh, Shero was a very exact director. He, con he, f he insisted upon directing his actors detail by detail by detail. Um, probably, in fact, he did not have too much time for improvisation. Uh, but um, he focused on detail, and we have, therefore, the persona in regie, the direction of the characters, is in fact very, very absorbing, right the way through the complete 15 hours. What he did do was, he freed the ring from its assist, uh, association with mysticism and with nobility. Uh, and in fact, it was a modern ring that, in fact, I think was perfectly attuned to the score, and ultimately, when one got used to the unfamiliar appearance of it, it did not seem to be an imposed idea at all. Uh, here we have got the summoning of the vassals. Um, this is, of course, the, um, uh, the, the, the famous uh, scene at the hydroelectric power dam. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the scene with dealing with the, um, the, um, the murder of, um, of, of Siegfried. Um, but this, of course, was a totally alien landscape for audiences at Bayreuth in 1976. And um, uh, here we have the moment that uh, was mentioned yesterday, uh, that moment where the whole crowd turns toward the audience, looks out at them and says, and now what? Or in other words, that question that I sort of uh, uh, mentioned yesterday, almost sort of seems to be thrown out into the audience by the crowd. And one thing that Jeffrey said that I thought was very interesting was that the costumes changed in the course of the production. And you know, when you look at this, on the whole, those costumes remind me of Dickensian England. There's a very sort of 19th century quality to them, which possibly was rather different when the production first came on. But this really was an important production. Not only was it, in fact, the, the, the first really successful production focusing upon economic and political themes, it also, of course, was seen in its time by more people than had ever seen The Ring before because it was put on television. Uh, it was the first, actually probably the first, one of the first major Wagner productions to be put on television. And, of course, what we had, what I showed yesterday, Today, uh, was actually the DVD that comes from that and it, it was actually this is what the world saw and I think it probably did quite a bit for people's appreciation of Wagner. Um, Harry Kupfer uh, sustained the tradition of doing um, military economic productions uh, both in Bayreuth and also at the Berlin Staatsoper. Here we have um, the, um, the summoning of the vassals from uh, the Staatsoper production. Um, his, his Bayreuth productions and and, and, and Starzo productions were not um, identical, but in many ways it was quite clear that they grew out of the same basic ideas. Um, there are notable industrial productions in industrial parts of the world. Here we have uh, a production directed by M. Leinert, I don't know who he is, 1999 from Cassell. Sorry, that's not much of a picture, uh, but um, I rather like this sort of, this red sort of, sort of um, sort of mini car here. Uh, this is uh, during the uh, summoning of the vassals, but quite obviously we have to pay most attention to all the smoke pouring out of the chimneys here. Uh, and, um, and then it was, there's a, a rather interesting looking production that occurred in Liège um, in 2004. And again, this is the summoning of the vassals with uh, what looks like an oil refinery in, in, in the background. Um, in fact, I wonder whether these two productions weren't in fact packed with local illusions. Um, 
Um, the Pierre Audi production that we saw the first act of uh, um, last time, um, actually, um, in, in, um, in later manifestations, um, it does seem to have uh, gathered together quite a bit of a sort of an, an, an industrial theme. In fact, uh, the Das Rheingold from the Pierre Audi uh, cycle is, in fact, overtly industrial. Uh, but this is from a revival of the Pierre Audi uh, production in Amsterdam in 2005, uh, The Summoning of the Vassals, where sort of the lighting and, 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 and here this great beam that we did see, of course, in the first act, and, and, and these walkways here tend to have a sort of a very sort of um, uh, sort of militaristic uh, in, industrial um, atmosphere. Uh, in the same year, there's a very interesting looking production of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, that took place in, in Wiesbaden in 2005, directed by John Dew. I don't know whether you know uh, John Dew's uh, uh, productions. He actually m works mainly in Germany, and he can always be relied upon to put on something that is very original and very witty. Uh, I have seen a number of his productions throughout Germany, not only of Wagner, and, I, and always when I see his name on the, pro uh, on, 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 on the website, I think, ah, that's a production to go to see. Uh, but this one uh, looks, it, it, it was actually Goethe Dammer set in the contemporary world of high finance. Um, uh, and here we have uh, Gutruna, um, Gunther and, uh, and Hagen. Look at that Hagen. <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, 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 looking at some of the pictures, one wonders whether it didn't perhaps uh, sort of lack a little bit of energy, except for the um, wedding scene in Act Two, where Brunhilde lays into, into Siegfried with, with a bunch of flowers. I'd love to have seen that. But, that, the, but John Dew, actually, um, uh, uh, he's one of those produ producers who maybe gets a little bit too close to trivialization. But this one does look really rather, rather, rather interesting. Um, the um, uh, Goethe Demmerung actually uh, ended with a very powerful industrial vision in Keith Warner's production at the Royal Opera House uh, in uh, 2006. Uh, and then, of course, there's a production that I know several of you are familiar with, because you've seen it on DVD. And this is La Fura del Spouse uh, that, that produced it in Valencia in, in 2009. Uh, I have only seen this on, on DVD. Um, and, and it strikes me on the whole as a production that tends to glorify rather than to throw doubts upon the value of technology, uh, mainly because the impact of the production actually does depend so strongly upon technology. Um, it is one of those productions that seems to sort of uh, sort of operate half between the stage and ha uh, and, and, and the movies um, I, I, I actually would like to see it on the stage and maybe it might even be worthwhile spending a few days in Houston uh, to, uh, to to go and see it when it's uh, completely revived by the Houston Opera um, but um, uh, it's only I think when you see it in the house that you could really judge the impact but you do get the impression that sort of these projections seem to be extraordinarily various and, and all over the place and they seem to dissolve the, uh, the, the, the limitations of the stage. Um, uh, and then, of course, sort of, we, we have the, the, another production that focuses very much upon uh, industry and, uh, and, and technology, etc. Is a, oh, oh, sorry, here we have another one, La Fura del Spouse, uh, and yet a third of La Fura del Spouse. But the other production that, 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 that um, focuses on this, of course, is uh, the Francesco Zambello production, uh, which you're going to be, you've seen the first three of, but you're going to be getting Goethe Demering in, in, two, in, in, in uh, 2016. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the uh, summoning the vassals scene, um, which actually was um, uh, quite um, uh, effectively um, uh, blocked. Uh, Francesco Zambello, I think, is one of the great uh, blocking directors. Her sense of the stage, her sense of moving people around. She has a wonderful sense of the dynamics of the space. Um, the, I wish I could have find, I couldn't find a picture of the most uh, the most um, uh, controversial uh, um, scene in this production, where the Rhine daughters are swimming in garbage. Uh, with uh, sort of, you know, sort of froth and, and, and styrofoam and, and, and rusty cars and things like that. Um, my, uh, my one reaction to this production was, to a certain extent, I think that sort of there, that the, the um, pollution theme was perhaps a little bit too heavy, particularly when you got those endlessly roaring sort of sort of videos of, of, of belching sort of uh, uh, of belching chimneys and everything and makes you realize that maybe to be most effective in the theater uh, you need to be a, a little bit discriminating I actually find that um, uh, Francesca Zambella rather like Peter Sellers they, those two are great 
directors of the theatre. They know how to operate people, uh, to, to work people in the theatre. However, video cameras should be taken out of their hands. Just a few more. Comic rings, as I say, actually maybe we need more comedy in the rings, in the, in the ring. Um, they're, um, uh, historically, I think the, the ring might have suffered a bit from people being a bit too serious in their approach. And there are some moments of surprising comedy, and I've already mentioned them, but in Goethe Dämmerung, uh, one of the most notable was in fact Peter Convictionist's production of Stuttgart in 2000 that begins as a farce. And uh, and, and Siegfried comes into the Gibichung Hall after this. He takes off his, um, his, his, his bear skins and he walks in in a dinner jacket and everything. And he starts behaving like a Noel Coward he hero, sort of a, or an Oscar Wilde hero, you know, sort of just sort of playing with everybody. And you think, what on earth is going on? And then the orchestra continues to play Wagner's score. And the most frightening and uneasy relationship is set up between the, the comedy on the stage and the, the relentless, Zagrzec was conducting, a very relentless dark reading of the score. And in that contrast, it was actually one of the most disturbing experiences I have had. I always find this with Convictionist Productions. He always begins, he's going to trivialize everything, let's throw it over. And by the time you end, he has you absolutely nailed to the central issues of the opera. Um, I might talk about this a little bit again uh, next year, because uh, I've got one very good example uh, to, to use from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Conviction in another opera. But here we have uh, Brunhilde, um, you know, sort of limbering up uh, Siegfried. Uh, they, quite frankly, they sort of, they, they're fooling around. Here we, by the way, have Grana. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and here we have the, uh, the murder of Siegfried. Um, and actually, what happens in the course of uh, in many conventional productions, you move from farce into deep and really committed tragedy, which is what does happen in the course of his Goethe Dämmerung. Even some of the most conservative critics in Germany, and believe you me, Germany has conservative critics, saw this production and ultimately, despite themselves, came out saying they had found it a, 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 a deeply moving experience. Uh, this was also Luana de Vol sang uh, um, uh, Brunhilde, and here she just has, she just has um, a, a, a toy horse, and she's in, dressed in a long red evening dress. And then when she finished, she just went off stage, and that was when Convictionally just direct, just projected the stage directions. And it was actually surprising how powerful it was. A very, very well-received production. A very idiosyncratic production, but an interesting one, not ultimately trivial. Uh, just a few more stylized rings. Um, uh, uh, now, um, um, uh, Achim Fryer has taken his LA ring, he's taken it to Mannheim, where he's been given a complete overhaul and put onto a flat stage instead of onto a, uh, a seriously raked stage. Um, it, it, it looks from pictures as if there is a little bit more attention to the, the, the literal aspects of the plot than there was in his, in his LA uh, production. Um, here we have got the, uh, um, the, I believe, the Summoning of the Vassals um, Act uh, 2. I wouldn't mind seeing that. I mean, the whole thing's being played out there as a party. Um, more serious in some ways, I think, is Dessau, a director I don't know, called A. Buka, uh, did a, a very modernist, severe modernist production uh, in 2012. Uh, and I like this in particular. He brings in a lot of, um, of, of um, uh, Asian theatre techniques. So you get a sense of a, a, a real sort of poise and a seriousness, maybe a return to ritual in the way in which um, uh, the action is represented. Um, it is both uh, indebted to the theatre of, uh, of East Asia, uh, but also, as we can see here, to the, uh, the European Piero Theatre as well. I found these pictures very, actually, uh, arresting. And I think um, I, I'm going to try and make an effort to get over to Germany to see this production when it next comes on, because there's, there are clearly some very uh, interesting ideas. Um, uh, quite clearly, this is the end. Quite clearly, somebody had probably had a, a garage sale on, uh, on Akim Fryer's um, sort of uh, um, neon uh, bands, because that is taken straight from the Fryer production. Uh, but um, this, I believe, is um, a, 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 of the final scene. Um, uh, Cottbus, small town in Germany, it's a rather interesting uh, uh, expressionist production in which all the action takes place down here and the, uh, and, and the chorus and the orchestra is in the back. Um, a, a difficult thing to do. Um, about two weeks ago, uh, they did um, A Streetcar Named Desire at the LA Opera, and a wonderfully, well, very, very beautifully sung production. And they went and put the orchestra at the back of the stage. Uh, and the stage 
uh, there were the singers was in the front. Uh, and um, it, it was actually quite nice to have the singers so close, but actually the orchestra was very, very muted because it was far in the distance. And I don't think you should ever mute a, a, an operatic or, or orchestra, particularly a Wagnerian orchestra. Uh, that is 